You're listening to Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast, a clear voice in chaotic times. Well, we've had a humble goal this week, have we not? We've turned a Missio Dei into a Missio Week. <laughs> pretty bad, chap. Yeah. You're my mentor. I want you to know that. <laughs> Our goal for the week has been simply to ask the question, how should the concept of mission affect what we value, what we think, and what we do as Christians? Uh, As we've said each and every day, actually, our goal for the week was simply to mess you up a bit this week. What we wanted to do was turn your theology inside out and turn your world upside down. We've attempted to do that by introducing you to that strange Latin phrase, the missio dei, We have defined that as simply God's intent and actions whereby all peoples may worship Him alone. Missio Dei, as you know, is the Latin expression that could be translated the mission of God or more literally the sentness of God or the sending of God. This phrase, we believe, captures that which God is ultimately about in the world. It is His intent from eternity that all of creation worship Him alone. And everything that God does, from the very first word of creation to the very end and the summation of all things, we believe, prosecutes this purpose of God, that all peoples, in all places, at all times, may know and worship Him alone. We also propose that this concept of Missio Dei is not just a a way that we think paradigmatically about God, but perhaps as well a way that we think about the story of the Bible. We propose the idea that mission is not something the Bible speaks about. In fact, we want to say that mission is what the Bible is about. Christopher Wright has said it this way, the Bible renders to us the story of God's mission through God's people in their engagement with God's world for the sake of the whole of God's creation. The Bible is the drama of this God of purpose engaged in the mission of achieving that purpose universally embracing past, present, and future, Israel and the nations, life, the universe, and everything in it. Wednesday, we explored how the concept of the Missio Dei affects the way we think about our humanity as the image of God. In that, we see that as the image of God, we have the privilege and the capacity to revere God in a unique worshiping relationship that only we have out of all creation, to reveal God, to throughout all the earth represent His presence and ultimately to represent as well His sovereign rule. We also saw that this same image, the image of God is Christ from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. And in that, we see that Christ as well reveres the Father, that Christ reveals the Father to all people, that Christ rules as Lord over all, and that ultimately the Lord Jesus redeems humanity. When we look at our own salvation, we see that we are, in fact, a divine foretaste of what we will be, and in that, we we continue to be all that God has created us to be. We now revere the Father and the Son in the power of the indwelling Spirit. We now reveal the one true God throughout all the earth, filling the earth with the testimony of Creator and Redeemer God. And we now rule over sin as we announce the gospel of the risen Christ. We introduce the idea that our salvation is not just a commodity that God has given us for our own sake, like Paul. The Missio Dei leads us to see our our salvation as the blessing of eternal life, the gift of mission, the grace of suffering for the sake of the gospel, and finally an obligation to testify to all of the Lord Jesus. Yesterday, we explored the implications of the Missio Dei for the people of God, the church. And in that, we see that corporately the people of God execute the mission of God in exactly the same way. 
The people of God also revere the Father and the Son in the power of the indwelling Spirit. The people of God also reveal the one true God throughout all the earth, filling the earth with the testimony of His presence. And the people of God also rule over sin and death by announcing the gospel of the risen and victorious Christ. Today, in another humble goal, we want to explore how the mission of God affects the very concept of the reign of God. When we begin to speak about the reign of God, our attention is first drawn to the very sovereignty of God, and I thought it would be helpful to back up just a bit and talk a bit about what sovereignty means. F. H. Kluster has defined sovereignty this way, the sovereignty of God expresses the very nature of God as all-powerful and omnipotent, able to accomplish His good pleasure, carry out His decreed will, and keep His promise. In the Scripture, the sovereignty of God is expressed as God is described as Creator, as the supreme ruler over all, and as the lawgiver. Paul wrote it this way to Timothy, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. The reign of God extends over all creation, from the very beginning, from the very first words, the sovereign rule of God over all that will come into existence is evident. Dr. Merrill has written it this way, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. By this simple but majestic affirmation, both king and realm are introduced. God's kingly role is apparent in His merely speaking the powerful word that brings into existence things that had never before been. The command, let there be, is imperious, not hesitant or doubtful. The whole narrative shows design, purpose, direction, order, and significance. An end is clearly rooted in divine omniscience and backed by divine omnipotence. And so when we begin to think about the reign of God and the sovereignty of God, we begin in the very creative act of God where as Creator, He establishes Himself as supreme ruler over all. But what's amazing is that the omniscient, omnipotent, sovereign God delegates the execution of His reign over all the earth to humanity. Again, Dr. Merrill, the climax of the narrative of Genesis 1 is the creation of mankind which in this context is also the clearest expression of the divine purpose in creation. After all things else had been made and put into their several positions of function and interrelationship, the Lord said, let us make man as our image according to our likeness. They will rule. What is lacking apparently after the whole cosmos has been spoken into existence is its management a caretaker, as it were, who will govern it according to the will of the Creator. He could have done it himself without mediation, but for reasons never revealed in the sacred record, God elected to reign through a subordinate, a surrogate king responded to him, responsible to him. The purpose of God in creation was channeled largely to man's faithfulness in bringing it to pass. And so the sovereign creator of all chooses to reign through humanity as he expresses his power and his rule. It's interesting that later God chooses to execute or to reign through a nation, the nation of Israel. As we compare, for example, God's promise to Abraham, which is unilateral, uh, what many call a royal grant, the fulfillment of that promise is never in doubt. The descendants of Abraham will always be the sons of Abraham, the children of God. But when we look at what God does when He creates a nation, when He delegates to them His sovereign reign as a nation, we see a different type of agreement, an agreement that is conditioned upon their obedience to the charter that He establishes with them at Sinai. At Sinai, God extends to Israel an amazing gift a charter that describes precisely how they can live out the character of the Creator God and the purpose of God in all the earth. 
He offers them a relationship that in subjection to Him, as they obey His law, they may enjoy incredible blessing while they serve His purposes in the world. And so the law, the Torah, the charter by which they live gives them a unique position in the plan of God. They are truly a a treasured people. It gives them a marvelously clear picture of God's holiness, of His righteousness, of His love, His virtues. And it gives them the opportunity to demonstrate throughout all the earth the one who has called them into existence. So Israel obligates themselves by receiving the charter to live in ways that honor Creator God and to prosecute His purposes. Let us never be mistaken that although God selects for Himself a particular people, a people through whom His reign will be expressed, the purpose of God has never changed. It is that His glory will be demonstrated among all peoples. Blessing and judgment and restoration, everything that God does with and through His people is always for the execution of His purpose for all peoples. Without ever diminishing all that God has given to Israel, we have to admit that everything that God does with and through Israel or did with and through Israel, He did not just for Israel's sake, but for the sake of all humanity. The promised end of God's plan for Israel, the glorious restoration of the kingdom of God at the coming of Messiah, is described as a time when nations will stream to be in the presence of the one who has returned, to worship Him in glorious praise and prayer. You may refer to dozens of passages in the Old Testament in the prophetic literature, Isaiah 55 verses 6 to 8 being simply one of those. But this reign of God is not just delegated and executed through His people. We also see that the reign of God is delegated and executed through His Son. Jesus' role as the divine king in the reign of God is evident from the time when the angels announced to Mary his birth. Luke chapter 1, verses 31 to 33 reads like this, You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and, he, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And so throughout his earthly life, Jesus announces and demonstrates that he is reigning as the delegated king. He took authority through his teaching and his preaching. He took authority over over the visible world and the invisible world through miracles and demonstrations of divine power. The exercise of divine power is seen, it seems to me, very clearly in passages like Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, where Jesus says, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Speaking of this passage, Robert Saucy has written this, here we see the possibility of a broader domain, a broader meaning for the kingdom. Obviously, the visibly glorious, all-conquering reign of Yahweh as anticipated in the Old Testament, was not there at the moment of the exorcism. What was there was the power of the divine spirit working through the uniquely anointed spirit bearer. This G and this Jesus calls the kingdom. And so Jesus exercises the reign of God on earth, showing authority over, over demons, over disease, teaching and announcing that God is present in a way that He's never been present before. And then, Jesus delegates His authority in the reign of God to His disciples. In Luke chapter 22, verses 29 to 30, we read this, And I confer on you a kingdom, just as the Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Darrell Bach has written this, Jesus indicates that the twelve form an integral part of His mission. This statement is an important declaration of Jesus' current authority, 
that though unique, is a shared authority that he does not hoard for himself. The use of kingdom here has a comprehensive sense and refers especially to Jesus' rule and the authority as God's commissioned agents. The present tense in this context mean they are joining the task now, not just later. Jesus' absolute authority, absolute authority over all things is the foundation upon which He sends His disciples and commissions them to announce His reign over all the earth. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus said. Therefore, in light of this authority, go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus' authority today, according to the Apostle Paul, extends to every domain. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 23, Paul writes it this way, that Jesus, as seated at the right hand of the Father, quote, in the heavenly realms, far above rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God has placed all things under His feet and appointed Him to be head over everything for the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way. And so, my dear friends, the the sovereign reign of Jesus is a reality that extends through every dimension of life. Every dimension of every moment of every day is somehow encompassed in the sovereign reign of the one called Lord of all. And so now the question comes up. What's the relationship between the mission of God and the, and the reign of God today? First, Jesus' authority to execute the mission of God is unquestioned. He is Lord of lords, Lord over all in every domain. Secondly, Jesus shares His authority with those who confess Him with the church. The gospel we preach is His gospel, the announcement of His intervention in human history, the defeat of sin and death in Him. It celebrates His authority and makes Him the crucible for all humanity. The church, it seems to me, executes the, the reign of Christ, the reign of God through the presence and power of the indwelling Spirit. J.V. Taylor has written it this way, the chief actor in the historic mission of the Christian church is the Holy Spirit. He is the director of the whole enterprise. The mission consists of the things that He is doing in the world. By the Spirit's power, we exercise authority over Satan. By denouncing Satan's power and rescuing humanity from his deception and his bondage. By the Spirit's power, we exercise, over, uh, exercise Jesus' authority over sin and death by announcing the victory that is ours in Him. By the Spirit's power, we exercise the authority of Jesus over injustice and human suffering by prophetically fighting against structures of evil in the world, by, by feeding, the, feeding the hungry and providing healing to the sick and safety for those who are weak. And by the Spirit's power, we exercise the authority of Jesus over lawlessness and rebellion by, by living out the very character of the righteousness of our God. It's by the Spirit's power the indwelling power of the Spirit, that we are able to execute the mission of God in the reign of Christ. In these last days, we wait for the full expression of the reign of Christ with urgent anticipation. We do not know, nor should we seek to know, when everything will be restored. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6, the disciples ask Jesus this very question, are you now going to restore everything? And Jesus answered very clearly, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority. The mission of the people of God in these days between the first coming of the Lord and the second coming of the Lord, whose timing we do not know, 
is to call men to repentance. That's the message of Acts chapter 3, verses 17 to 21. That's the reason we remain between the advents, to call men to believe, to turn away from their rebellion before Christ, to experience forgiveness of sin and the nearness, the refreshing of God that is theirs in Him. The restoration of everything when Christ returns will be accomplished by Christ in ways that only He can accomplish it. In all honesty, I suspect that every person in this room is going to be surprised by how Christ establishes His reign. I think we will marvel at the magnificent simplicity and clarity of it all. Our fascination, sometimes even our obsession, with attempting to predict when Christ will return by placing contemporary political entities into the eternal plan of God is not productive, in fact, even contradictory to our purpose during these days in the mission of God. I'll never forget during the time of Israel's retaliation in Lebanon this past summer, as hundreds of people were displaced all through southern Lebanon in Beirut, I asked our church to pray for three things in the Middle East. I asked our church to pray for peace. I asked our church to pray for justice. And I asked our church to pray for the gospel, the preservation of the testimony of Jesus in those lands. And after we prayed for those things and the service ended, a man came up to me and he said, isn't it neat to see how God's working out His prophetic plan in Lebanon? And I thought to myself, neat isn't really the word. I wonder if my Lebanese friend Paul, living in Beirut, being forced to hide in bomb shelters and evacuate, thinks that Israel's retaliation was neat. I wonder if his wife, Agnes, who has spent years cultivating contacts in the Palestinian slums outside of Beirut with a mobile medical clinic and setting up mobile literacy centers, I, I wonder if as she fled the country for, with her own life, barely, I wonder if she thought it was neat. My dear friends, our obsession with trying to understand and place in context contemporary political realities into a future plan of God is ultimately, ultimately contrary to the mission that we've been given. We must be known for the gospel above all else. Not knowing the time of the future coming then of the, of the, of the promised king, we know for sure that he will come. The certainty of Jesus' future reign gives us joyful assurance that the purpose of God will ultimately be accomplished. Today, as we participate in the purpose of God, although we know that the end is sure, what we are promised is suffering and the sufficiency of God's grace, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. As the light of the glory of Christ breaks Satan's blinding darkness, only violence and suffering can ensue. Paul's words in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29 are telling. He says to the Philippian believers, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe, but to what? Suffer for Him. The word translated granted here means to give freely or graciously as a favor. And so God has given us as a favor the privilege of suffering as Satan's domain is conquered by the truth of the gospel. And we may suffer, but we never suffer as those with no hope. For we know with all certainty that ultimately the mission of God, when all peoples and all places at all times will worship Him 
and Him alone is a reality. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, Paul wrote it this way. Therefore God exalted Him to be the, to the highest place and gave Him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, John's heavenly vision in included the angels crying out, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men of God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And so the ultimate mission of God is sure, because people from every tribe and language will be centered around Him. And John had one greater vision in Revelation chapter 7 of those who had survived the great tribulation. It reads like this. John says, after this I looked, and there, be there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb and they were wearing white robes and were holding branches in their hands. نجات ہمارے خدا کی طرف سے ہے جو تخت پر بیٹھا ہے اور برہ کی طرف سے ہے آمین حمد اور تمجید اور حکمت اور شکر اور عزت اور قدرت اور طاقت Zbawienie u Boga naszego, zasiadającego na tronie i u baranka. Amen. Błogosławieństwo i chwała i mądrość i dziękczynienie i cześć i moc i potęga Bogu La naszemu na pertenece a nuestro Dios, Amen. que está sentado en el trono y al Cordero. Amén. La bendición, la gloria, Amen. la sabiduría, Udhar ke liye sihasan par virajman hamare parmeshwar aur mem ne ka jay jaykar ho amin hamare parmeshwar ki stuti mahima gyan dhanyawad aadar samarthya aur shakti yugan yog bani rahe amin simhasana da mele kulitu kholluva namma prabhuvige mattu kurimari yadathanige jayavu labisitu Amen. Namma Devarige, Stotravu, Prabhavu, Nanavu, Protagnata Stutiyu, Gauravu, Adhikaravu, Mattu Bhalavu, Yuga Yuga Hantara Galiliyu, Irali. Udhagiri, Sihasan Parvirajman, Hamare Parmeshwar ka, Or Mevni ka, Yolano Vachyo Jokodori cha. Amin. Hamare Parmeshwar ki Stuti, Mahima, Gyan, Dhanyavad, Adar, Samathe, or Shakti, Yugan, Yog, Bani Rahe, Amin. Fung, or Lord, and Wa, Lai, Adichit, Lai, Lai, Amin. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. 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 Amen.